Hello there, we are your host Vivek and Pavitra from the Agile Coach Podcast. In this podcast, we bring fresh perspectives to you through our interviews with thought leaders in Agile Coaching, Facilitation, Business Analysis, and Product Management roles. Enjoy! Lauren, what is Product Management? For me, product management is the idea that there is a central person uh, in, within a product squad embedded in the overall idea of what the product needs, whose responsibility is finally to deliver the product, to shepherd it throughout each and every stage. Whereas though they never actually build the product themselves, they always have to collaborate with different stakeholders to move it through that life cycle. Right. Uh, what, what is, how do you define of what a product is? Well, that's a difficult question because honestly, a lot of people are product managers, but they end up working on features. In the end, mm -hmm. it is uh, one scope that a product squad can reasonably work on on its own that has a direct impact on business metrics and ideally even has its own responsibility for profit and loss for the company. Mm -hmm. Why do you think product management is awesome, Lauren? Mm -hmm. I mean, you get to create to you. stuff. It, yeah. Yes, you get you get to build stuff. I mean, even though you're not necessarily the one building it, but you get to define, like find problems, define solutions and build the uh, stuff and get people to use it in such a short time frame that, especially if you're in digital mm -hmm. product management uh, that I have not had in any other kind of job. Like you create stuff basically. <laughs> nice. Um, in contrast to project management, uh, what is product management? What is the difference between product and project management? I think the main difference is that projects uh, define have defined scopes or defined timelines, whereas a product is out there not to solve a one-time problem or to bring something in the world and then not look at it, but continuously deliver value to users. So you can always be better. You can always do more and the work never stops. So basically, unless the product is discontinued, there is always... Um, yeah, you can always strive for improvement. Nice. Uh, why do you think product management is like an essential discipline in product development process? We have to cut this. <laughs> Don't get okay, the sure. <laughs> uh, so why, why product management? So why product management? Uh, because there's a lot of companies that actually uh, don't have product managers uh, just for, for that yeah. crowd. Yeah, it's it's quite interesting. Um, there's different philosophies. Uh, Google took very long historically to hire their first product managers and they had engineers there that had of what classically product managers were. And a lot of different companies are also mm. still doing that in their early stages. Like Notion took also forever to hire their first product manager. Airbnb mm -hmm. just decided to get rid of their product management function because they want their product designers to take that responsibility. So hmm. what is very important to understand is that to make a product successful, there's a lot of things that need to happen. Uh, and depending hmm. on which company you work in or what the focus of a company is, the focus might be more on UX and design. It might be more on technically, or it might be more on the business side or the, uh, the user side. And usually in companies where product management is embedded, it's usually a well-rounded uh, thing where you need one person who's not necessarily an expert in either of them, but make sure mm -hmm. to find the best balance between the three for what the product needs. So in the example mm -hmm. of Airbnb, they just want UX to always be the number one. So they don't need PM. Mm -hmm. They can have everything under designers or notion they wanted the best technological approach so engineering is on top of everything and the other things are below but in most companies it's like a triangle that has equal weights and you need someone to uh, yeah facilitate between the three sides nice um give uh, give us a week to like a week of a product manage uh, manager what does that look like yeah, I think uh, we all, all have our ideal weeks of what we want to do in every given day. And then shit happens, uh, you get punched in your face and your plan is completely uh, for scrap. So ideally, I would want to spend 20% of my time, usually uh, around release day, uh, to look at data. Like we release, I look if anything changed for the current cohort of current users coming in, or I take the time also to look at what happened in the last week. Um 
Then another 20% of my time is around the sprint planning. So every, every one to two weeks, like in my current company, I have weekly sprints and I need to make sure that the requirements are ready. So uh, make sure that all of the tickets are created, all the doc- documentation makes sense. Spend time on that. Another 20% would be on stakeholder management. So whatever we shipped out, whatever I learned, whatever I see in the metrics and product, well, what I learned from users, I need to distribute uh, with everyone, with all the stakeholders. So they also have the learnings. You have emails and overhead, uh, answering Slack messages, follow-up questions. That's a, that's a big portion. And then lastly, strategizing. So either looking at what competitors are doing, asking myself, is my product strategy still relevant? Uh, do we need to change anything? Talk to the main, like the C-level, the leadership team in the company and seeing like de- developing the roadmap beyond on what we're working on right now, but what's coming next. Great. Um, Lauren, if, and this might be a little bit longer answer, um, what are the, what are the skill sets and mindset needed for somebody to become an effective product manager? Yeah, it's uh, quite interesting because in my, in my experience, you don't need experience to be a product manager, but in almost every company or in every, just like in every job, that's what people primarily look for. But when I hire, for example, I look for people with mindset. So there's one thing, mm. which is effective communication and structured communication. So if you get mm. a vague pro- problem, how do you approach it to solve it? How do you, co- even though the answer is completely wrong, be- I don't care because you don't have, like, if I give you a product case in a recruitment process, for example, mm. I know you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the understanding of the company to be able to answer it correctly, but it should make sense of h- mm. how um how your uh, idea of thought flows through so you see a mm. problem you think about how can i find possible solutions how do i validate the solutions and how do i implement them and this kind of thought process should make sense so structure communication um there should be some form of attention to detail because in the end you're the final responsible for the product so you should be you should get you should be upset if it's not implement if something is not implemented the right way. So you hold Mm. people accountable to the highest standards, like your designers, your engineers, or the QA team. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you just need to be good with digital tools. Like you should be, you should be kind of digital native because all the communication organization happens in tools like Jira, Slack, and not be overwhelmed. Like you should be quite Mm -hmm. good in, uh, in keeping a hold of, uh, a lot of open, open threads, because you being, like I mentioned, uh, before the shepherd of the product, uh, that requires you to talk to a lot of different things and basically put a lot of things in motion. And you need to track that those things get to completion, even though you're not the person completing them, because in the end, they will live in your main document, your product requirements document. And you need to make sure that every task that needs to be done for planning or for execution, gets finished. So basically a good, good ability to manage multiple things at the same time. Right. Lauren, what does, when you're interviewing new candidates, um, you talked about structured thinking. So what are the components? What's the framework for com- uh, structured thinking? Um, and how do people learn that? And you, I know you teach that in the class too, but just give people like a high level of uh, what structured thinking uh, looks like. Yeah. Well, there's not one framework. It's rather that when you see, when you have a vague problem to solve, you find like you either use an existing framework or you come up with an easy framework that you can apply to it. And usually, mm-hmm. um, usually all these frameworks, they follow uh, a certain, like they all, they all have the same underlying idea, depending on what problem you need to solve. For example, you need mm-hmm. to solve a prioritization problem. You will have some sort of impact, effort, uh, metric, mm. like impact on metrics. How many users does it affect? So you should just mm. have this already in mind. If I'm mm. asked to prioritize, what's the framework I'm going to use? Or when you yeah. have to set, when you have to build a plan, like how does, how do you set a roadmap that makes sense? Like, uh, there are frameworks for building roadmaps. So, okay, I'm supposed to mm. build a plan. Uh, what's my roadmap uh, framework? If you're supposed to set a strategy, Okay, we mm. talked about the product development hierarchy. Uh, mm-hmm. Okay, I have to set a strategy, product development hierarchy. And you can apply it, even it might not be 100% fitting, then you can make some adjustments. Let's say they ask you, make a plan of vision 
metrics, user persona, and something else. And you're like, okay, so I use the product development hierarchy. I slide user personas in. How do I do user personas? What's the framework for that? You use that framework and then uh, you communicate based on that. And I always try to keep it as simple as possible. People don't need completion of like uh, 10 different bullet points. Uh, it's rather what are the main things and what's the main point for your like three main things that you want to communicate. Amazing. Lauren, um, we, we talked about AI and chat GPT, uh, and we even used some of the examples earlier, um, using chat GPT. So for somebody who is a new product owner, product manager, who's gone to the class, who understands the foundation, but doesn't have a lot of actual experience um, doing product management and they get hired into your team, how do you recommend that they use ChatGPT or other language learning models um, or other AI tools? What can they um, use and what should they be paying attention to? Yeah, so I think it's it's a bit dangerous to just say, okay, use ChatGPT and use that to, to do your work because hmm. it will generate a lot of content it sounds good and it sounds logical, but mm. it's very basic. You're not gonna, and you're not gonna build a, ne a next level kind of product, or you're not gonna come up with good new solutions by using ChatGPT to mm. ask about the specific problems that you ha you're facing in in your product. Like when you say, uh, I've, I've experienced this before. I tried it. Like you would tell Chat, you'll tell a tool like that, hey. I'm seeing this in my product. What should I do? Like I'm seeing people drop off and it will spout the five basic things. And no matter what your product is, no matter what you do, it will always say the same things like, Oh, do an onboarding, um, improve the user experience, da, 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 da. but it's, it's not specific enough. Uh, and that's where then it's your job to really find out how can you solve it? Of course, if you don't have an onboarding, yeah, maybe you should do an onboarding, but maybe there's something completely different that you should do. Uh, but yeah. where you can use it is one as a devil's advocate. So you put, mm. this is my plan. Find, like, think, look at it from the perspective of a CEO. What, uh, what mm. information do you find missing? Or look at it as, from the perspective of as an engineering manager. What information mm. do you find missing? So it can actually, mm. you can get super quick feedback on what you're working on, implement that mm. feedback directly. So when you send it out for the first time, you basically reduce the cycles of the repeating cycles of feedback because you're already preemptively figured out what will they be asking, even though you're not an engineer, you wouldn't know necessarily what they require. It's very good for f coming up with frameworks like, hey, I'm I'm supposed to uh, make a plan for X, Y, Z. How could I structure it? And it usually will suggest existing frameworks or come up with new frameworks. So putting structures mm. and putting templates. So instead of you have a blank canvas that you need to start on with like the tasks that you have, uh, you can just say, hey, these are all the outside facts, what should I do? For example, mm -hmm. um, I had to do a communication for sunsetting a feature once. And I was saying, okay, this is what we're sunsetting it. This is the timeline. Uh, mm -hmm. Here are links to our documentation for the feature. Uh, here are things that people need to be aware of. Write me a basic sunsetting announcement message. And then it, it got a lot of the things wrong. But it, I had a basic structure that then I could mm. improve upon, and I was done in much shorter time than I would have been otherwise. Amazing, uh, Lauren. How do you see as so now we're at ChatGPT four, as ChatGPT five and six comes? How do you see see the um, uh, evolution of product management practices, or do you, do you are you hopeful that um, these tools will um, be able to accelerate product development in the future. What, where, what's your stand? Uh, at least chat GPT six plus. Um, <laughs> or yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how, uh, how directly it will change the basic tasks that you're doing as a product manager, because you're not necessarily creating things. You're not producing things like, for example, the designer or an engineer would, um, but I mm. think it's going to lower the barrier of experimentation of and testing things. And it's going to allow product managers to communicate 
their ideas much more effectively. Mm. Like, let's say there are uh, companies, there are products that already work on making um, text-based, input-based design creation. Of course, the design, you, mm -hmm. you will not be able to teach this easily to look like your product's supposed to look, but it's much easier to create something that looks like a finished product to communicate, this is how it's supposed to work, this is how it's supposed to look like, and makes mm -hmm. it easier for you to communicate with a designer. Or... Um, Probably there's going to be tools in the future that create a whole working web application based on the input that you give it. Like I want a website that does X, Y, Z. And the good mm -hmm. thing is that the, uh, like the amount of learning that you will get before committing the actual development resources to it is going to be of much higher fidelity because it's not just going to be uh, a flow chart suddenly that you produce as a product manager or drawn wireframe, suddenly it's a working product and you can click and see how does this feel? Does this feel right or does this feel wrong? And like basically before you committed development resources and learning this, you can already make those calls while you're still in your research phase. So basically the tool set that you will get in the pr uh, product research phase before you bring it to your stakeholders will become, uh, will become more accessible. And, Another way I think about it is probably it will require product managers also to, uh, or it will allow them to manage multiple products at the same time, because a lot of the work that we do as product managers still is quite repetitive, like things like writing uh, product release uh, logs or feature PR, even PRDs, like writing all the documentation around it. It is repetitive with... Mm -hmm elements in between that are flexible. But if you work with uh, large, large language models that start getting a bigger context window, meaning imagine they could, they could know everything that you know, you feed them all the PRDs and they know the development of the product because you've had one chat thread for one year where it remembers everything that you've been talking to. Like if you imagine that it would be able to make much better recommendations. So suddenly you, you can basically work with more product teams or with more squads at the same time, because you can make all these decisions much faster. Amazing. Lauren, I'm curious how, let's say if you have a friend who is not in um, tech or in product and, you know, somebody comes to you and asks, oh, what is happening? What, what is AI and LLMs? Like, how would you make that real for them? Um, in, in very simple it. terms, <laughs> yeah. I would show it Just to them. Their mind. Open, I would Look. Uh, <laughs> I would show chat to you. No, the interesting thing is people have uh, very they have very different expectations from these tools. Uh, mm. They they use them. I don't know how to describe it. Like how are you? I uh, I have an inherent understanding by using it of what it can do and what it cannot do. So people mm. like when you tell the, oh, it's this magic thing that can do everything. And then they come and they ask it things like, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? Or mm -hmm. uh, I, had, I was working with someone who is a, who works in a bookstore and he wanted it. He wanted ChatGPT then to find a very rare book that, uh, that is not accessible anywhere. It's like, Hey, can you find me a link so I can read it? So it's like, it, they wanted to do like, like, if you don't know how it works, you would think, this can work. Um, so I would basically uh, give them, like I would ask them a little bit about what they're currently working on. And mm. then, uh, because everyone in the end, uh, like has to, for example, write emails or communicate something and then say, okay, describe, for example, an email that you wrote yesterday, describe what was the problem and what you wanted to be approached. And probably it took you three hours to write that difficult email and then they will get an email that will be 80 percent correct and they'll be like oh wow i could have used this and it would have been good enough and it would have taken me five minutes so yeah. something like that <laughs> sounds good sounds good all right thank you so much lauren all right that's a wrap with this episode Thank you for listening till the end. We hope these podcasts are providing value on your Agile journey. If you haven't visited our website, theagilecoach.com, we highly suggest you for other courses and supporting material on your journey. You can also get access to our self-paced courses or learn more about the live training that we provide to become a Scrum Master, Product Owner, Product Manager. With that, we will see you on the next episode love and best wishes from the Agile Coach.